Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to Durban and to this World Economic Forum annual uh, summit on Africa 2017. My name is Adrian Monk. I'm on the managing board of the forum, and it's my great pleasure to introduce this session with uh, a man of the hour, uh, Malusi Gigaba, Minister of Finance for South Africa. Please give him a big round of applause, big welcome. Now, you've got to do a bit of imagining in this session. You've got to imagine we're in a kind of cozy alpine fireside here, and that none of these people are really here. Um, so it's just between the two of us. Don't worry about them and the cameras and the lights. It's a cozy fireside chat. You know, if I, if I was in Switzerland, I'd throw in a fondue and a couple of other things just to relax you. Um, but I want to just start by asking a little bit about the man behind the office. What took you into politics? You know, I think your first given name is Knowledge. Is that, is that right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and it sounds very much from hearing about your mum and dad, your, your father was a pastor, your mum a nurse, that they had in mind that you become a, a teacher, you know, you studied education. So where did the teaching stop and the politics come in? What took you into? Well, in a way, um, I, I also sort of um, evolved because at one stage, because my father was a pastor, I wanted to become a bishop. Uh, I, I imagined myself wearing those long robes, um, you know, carrying those uh, uh, pastoral sticks that uh, uh, bishops, uh, Anglican bishops carry. And I evolved to wanting to become an attorney, and my father discouraged me by saying that actually you are going to have to lie on behalf of criminals. And I moved completely away from that and uh, wanted to become an optometrist and ended up training as a teacher because I think I enjoyed it. At one stage, I was a Sunday school teacher at church. Um, so politics, in a way, was forced on us uh, by circumstances. The, the apartheid government uh, violated us into the struggle against it. So we found ourselves getting involved at, a very, at very young ages into politics, and it, it never stopped from there. It's about the only thing that I know since then. And you were three times leader of the, the ANC's Youth League, weren't you, in your, in your 20s. Um, quite a record. Would the young you, the 19-year-old you, go into politics in the same way today? Many of them actually do. I think we, we were driven not only by a, an angry response to the regime, but by a commitment to serve the people of South Africa. We, we were uh, informed then, as many still are now, by that burning desire to serve the people, to enforce the change. And there are many in, in our country young politicians, young political activists that are involved in politics. The conditions are not the same in, in, in the sense that the, the environment we found when we joined politics then doesn't exist in the same way today. But there still are many young people in universities who are involved in politics and who share equally a desire to serve the country, to serve the movement, to serve our people. And I think it's something that we need to continue nurturing. But with 56% youth unemployment, you're looking at a generation that perhaps in your generation you saw very clearly what the problem was. You know, their generation is probably looking and saying, well, maybe you're the problem. You know, that your government is the problem and that we need to do something about that. Would, you know, how would you respond? How would the young you respond to the situation you see now around you? Well, if, if I was young, I would say that the structure of the South African economy is, is creating the difficulties that young people are facing. And youth unemployment in particular was already rife around 1991-92 when I was involved in youth politics. I remember when we established the National Youth Development Forum, I became the secretary of the provincial um, no, no, the Regional Youth Development Committee in Southern Natal in Deben here. 
and we were confronted with this very stubborn unemployment of young people and we struggled with a number of things. I remember back then the debates about whether we were a lost generation, how to create youth employment. We came up with proposals uh, such as youth uh, leadership programs, the National Youth Service Program. All of those were an attempt to respond to youth unemployment. In, in, in the mid-90s, uh, during my presidency, I think around 1998, the ANC Youth League uh, drafted the youth employment um, uh, program, the youth employment strategy, and made a number of proposals. In that document, we argued that in the first instance, Youth unemployment is a result of aggregate unemployment in the economy, the stubbornness of, um, uh, or, or the, the defects in the structure of the economy at the time. And we argue that in order to address it on a sustainable basis, we need to create, to change the structure of the economy, create aggregate employment in order to get young people working, but at the same time to come up with specific interventions. So the ANC's always had if you like, a gradualist approach to solving the economic uh, challenges that South Africa faces. And you recently said in a speech just after taking office that you, know, you thought the ANC had been too conservative. Do you want to unpack that a little bit for our audience? In what way has it been too conservative and how should it be more radical? Well, I, I said that there have been those who have argued that the ANC has been conservative in, in, in approaching the e economic transformation. And you know, when, when you listen to the arguments about what, what we have done over the last 23 years and what we could have done better, my, my argument would be we, 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 we could have um, better changed the structure of production in the economy to diversify um, the South African economy and, and create a, a thriving manufacturing sector. We, we have done it to some extent. Yes, we could have done more. We could have uh, focused a lot on beneficiation, developing the skills and capabilities, particularly of young people. We could have um, implemented some of the programs such as uh, greater investments into the SME development and, and investing in um, or, or paying attention in changing the regulatory framework for the development of SMMEs. We have not paid sufficient attention to developing a productive economy in the townships and rural areas. Because when you look at the South African economy or, or the economy of our cities today, you know, you, you can't look at our cities as if they are homogeneous structures. There, there are real problems that exist in the townships, in the rural areas, related to the absence of productive economic opportunities that most of our townships, the, the economy that, um, is take, that is there is based on um, like menial economic activities, puzzle shops, car washes, hair salons. The, the townships are far away from the city centers and the spatial um, problems of the apartheid system have not been addressed sufficiently. So there's quite a number of things that we could have addressed that we have not addressed sufficiently. And, and so you must understand the impatience for speedy change, for more significant change. And that's why the ANC around 2011 said the president speaking in Polokwane, the January 8th statement of the African National Congress said, we now must make a meaningful shift towards economic transformation and begin to take on board those who have remained marginalized from the economy. You, you can always, and, and we must always maintain that ability to be self-critical because we cannot be absolutely correct in everything we do at all times. In future, we must always um, maintain that um, ability to, to look back in retrospect and say we could have done better. So probably not just you saying that, it's also international investors and the international community. I mean, the, the, 
Yes. What greeted your appointment was a downgrade in, in South Africa's uh, bond status. Um, you know, one of the things that the S&P looked at when it made that decision, they looked at five major factors. One of the ones that was marked as strong was South Africa's institutions, its, uh, its democracy. But the weakest was fiscal debt. You know, that was the trigger for the downgrade that took place uh, on their rankings. Now, right here, you have an opportunity to let people know what your policy will be uh, around debt. Are you going to be borrowing to solve the problems you just outlined? Or are you going to be following through on the previous uh, ministerial trajectory of reining in spending and, uh, and trying to push up revenue? You know, at a, at a technical level, the, the, the budget for 2017 has been presented to parliament and, and adopted. And a whole lot of processes have uh, gone through in terms of uh, the provincial divisions of revenue in all the provinces. Municipalities have presented their budgets. The integrated development plans have been uh, developed and many of them are in the process of finalization. And so pretty much the budget for 2017 is set and, and nobody must tamper with that process. Okay.